My presentation is called Shadows of Middle Earth, Talking in Subculture, Counterculture and Exploitation. And it's a quick and basic look into several phenomena belonging to the subcultural, countercultural and exploitation fields that were somehow influenced or inspired by Tolkien's works. We will start by defining some of these terms. There we go. Subculture, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, is a cultural group within a larger culture, often having beliefs or interests at variance with those of the larger culture. Counterculture, on the other hand, is a way of life and set of attitudes opposed to or at variance with the prevailing social norm. An exploitation film is a type of cinema often typically produced that is designed to create a fast profit by referring to or exploiting contemporary cultural anxieties. These examples would include, for example, um, uh, films about drug use, nudity, striptease, violence in society, youth gangs, deviance, and so on. We are going to talk first about a well-known subculture, which is the hippie subculture. In uh, 1965, 12, 12 years after being published in the UK, ACE published the pirate editions of uh, these three volumes of The Lord of the Rings. They were very cheap because they were paperbacks. Before this edition, there were no paperbacks in the United States, so they were sold really quickly. They were only 75 cents each, so you can imagine. Uh, and then uh, Valentine Books uh, was very quick and published their own paperback editions the same year. Tolkien himself uh, recommended to buy the official editions. And in 1968, more or less 3 million copies of this authorized edition were sold. What ideas did hippies found in Tolkien's works that they shared with uh, the values inside Tolkien's works? The idea of community, for example, the different uh, cultures working together, uh, the difference from another cultures that can enrich our lives and let us know all the points of view. We have to take into account that they will live in the heyday of the civil rights movement. Other idea would be ecologism, the rejection of the artificial and the love for nature. This is um, related directly with pacifism, which is a, a maxim a uh, very important idea from the hippies. Uh, we must take into account also that they were living the missile crisis of Cuba. They were living also the presence of atomic weapons in China and uh, the war of Vietnam. And third, this capism, which is, I think, the most important idea. They related the consumption of uh, long bottom leaf, for example, and mushrooms to their own consumption of LSD in order to escape the reality. The most widely known groupie in England, Jenny Fabian, wrote an uh, autobiography called Groupie, in fact, and she says, and I quote, many of us use talking as a guide in our journeys and acid trips were very similar to the journeys depicted in Lord of the Rings. It's an inner psyche journey. At the Middle Earth Club, many people took acid in the Black Walls room because it made them feel in other world. This Middle Earth Club was located in London in, at the basement of the 43 King Street. And it was widely known and it was very important at that era. We must also uh, look at the gigs that they organized. You have an example on the screen right now. This was too big to be hosted in the Middle Earth Club, so it was hosted in the new Roundhouse. Um, it lasted from the beginning of the 1960s up to 1968 when it was closed and it suffered several raids from the police where they found lots of drugs and even a trip machine. I don't know what it is, but it sounds funny. <laughs> Um, we also can take a look at the English magazine, magazine Gandalf Garden. It was not just a magazine, it was also a community of people, kindred spirits that shared the same ideas about mystical, about alternative thinking and so on. Um, they even had a shop in Chelsea where they sold several products and they fundraised money for the magazine by selling these products and also by organizing some gigs. In fact, one of the most famous ones was uh, one that had as a headline act, David Bowie. 
Um, there were several groups also formed in the hippie movement with names and references to Tolkien. For example, The Hobbits, that was formed by Jimmy Curtis, is a singer-songwriter. And the first album is this one, uh, Down to Middle Earth, and it was released in 1967. The author David Carradine called Lord of Rings the metaphysic declaration of our times. In 1971, in the United States, uh, precisely in uh, Giants Avenue, Phillipsville, Northern Carolina, an amusement park based in The Hobbit was built. Right now it's abandoned, but it still preserves some remains, such as this sign, take, pay attention to the small one, hold on to your ticket, or suffer the wrath of Smaug, for example. In here we have a map of Thorin, inside a sign. Here you have Gollum, that was displayed inside a, shallow, a hollow tree. Here we have some goblins carrying barrels. This is the entrance to the amusement park. As you can see, Hobbiton USA. There was a sign in the road, for example, that said Hobbiton USA with a detour. You can see a mill and on the right you can see a Hobbit hall. They even had some electronic features like this one where you could push a button and listen to a story. And this is the entrance to Bag End with Gandalf, or Gandalf on the front. This was, in fact, the entrance to Bag End because nowadays it's abandoned and derelicted and it has this look. It's still a very interesting place for fans of uh, abandoned places. What was happening in Italy at the same time? Well, in 1971, The Lord of the Rings was translated into Italian. And in 1977, uh, the first Hobbit camp was celebrated, the first Campo Hobbit. If you pay attention to the sign on the left, it says alternative music, alternative debate, alternative graphic. This could take us to an idea of, for example, the Glastonbury Festival or even the Woodstock Festival, but nothing far less from reality because this was a fascist camp. The writings from the traditionalist philosopher Julius Evola were we read in this era with ideas such as European decadence due to progress, truths such as royalty, law, empire, spiritual virility, initiation and the sacred chivalry or lineage. Um, what did they take from Tolkien that made them uh, name this camp, Campo Hobbit? Well, the isolated hobbits and their nostalgic vision as an ideal and pacifist society, the novel struggles of traditional societies against the menace of industrialization and progress. These two ideas were taken with them, along with their rejection of foreigners, strangers, strangers and progress, for example. It was uh, organized by the Fronte de la Juventud, and they were also supported by the New Rights Association, and another association such as Movimiento Sociale Italiano. We have here Generoso Simeone, who is the head of the movement. There were some speeches, there were presentations, there were debates, uh, round tables, and even music. Some musical groups were created during this Campo Hobbits. For example, Compañía del Anello, the Fellowship of the Ring, which is a folk fascist group. Several Campo Hobbits were organized in the following years, not many, but in 2017, uh, the 40 Campo Hobbit was organized. It was not the 14th, it was the 40, because it was the 40th anniversary of the first one. And Julius Ebola is being reread nowadays again. Let's go to another slide. We will merge into the world of graffiti. Graffiti comes from Latin scarifare. That means to incite with a scarifus, and it goes back to the Roman Empire, uh, where people made satiric or social claiming paintings or scratchings in the public places of uh, Rome and all over the Roman Empire, the, in the public spaces like political claims. This is quite a peculiar example of a Tolkienian graffiti, because you can see in here the company of Thorin fleeing from the works and the goblins 
when they abandon Goblin Town, you can see the pine trees uh, that are burning. Uh, you can see the great eagles, you can even see Gandalf. And this graffiti is to be found in Lord of the Rings Online. This is inside the game. So yeah, goblins also made graffitis. I have prepared a handful of different graffitis and different techniques um, to show you in this presentation. The first one is a stencil. It's made with a template and this one is located in Cincinnati. This is a crew graffiti, which means that lots of artists gather uh, in order to make a big panel or a, a big piece. You can see Sauron over there, you can see on the far left uh, Nazgul with its horse. This belongs to the International, Out uh, the International Outlaws and it's located in the Czech Republic. Here you have a freehand graffiti. They are typically made with two or three different colors and they are made without any template. Uh, this belongs to flat 15 and it's located in uh, Trani, Italy. And here you have a real masterpiece from while drawing. It's called My Melted Pressures. You can see that in the fingers in, of Smaug, he has a melting euro coin. It's a criticism to capitalism. It's located in Malta. And this artist was born in Bali, but he lives in Greece and he has pieces all over the world. In fact, Smigol is one of the recurring themes he has. This last graffiti, it's a curiosity <laughs> because it's a Tengwar graffiti in Philadelphia. And in fact, this sentence is not written in Elvish. It's written in uh, Tamarian. One of the languages is spoken in, in Star Trek. It says, also of origami that comes from the Japanese word ori, which means to fold and kami, which means paper. These three belong to a much bigger collection of pieces from Eric Joycel. He made an entire collection of pieces uh, based in Tolkien. Remember that these pieces are made only folding one sheet of paper. Uh, on the left you have got Gimli, in the center you have Aragorn, and on the right you have Legolas. They are the three hunters. This uh, Gandalf in horseback was made by Xiao Chen. This is an astonishing Legolas made by Leo Lai. And this wonderful and monstrous Balrog was made by Jason Ku. For the number shown in the next slide, it takes charisma, uniqueness, nerve and talent. I have prepared a brief video for you to watch. I recommend you to enjoy it.
I don't know if you ever imagined to watch a drag queen number based in Tolkien. Here we are. <laughs> talking in the world of drag. What is the world of drag? It's a subculture that includes cross-dressing for artistic purposes. Drag queens do not wish to represent an actual woman, but they use the artifacts that naturally, culturally are associated with the idea of a woman, such as the high heels, the makeup or the hairdos. They exaggerate them in order to create a character. This is Sasha Velour. It's the drag persona of Alexander Hedges Steinberg, who was the winner of America's Next Drag Superstar in 2017 by winning the contest America um, RuPaul's Drag Race. This number is called Lady Gollum. It's one of the oldest number that she has. In fact, it was the first number that she made when she uh, moved to New York. It was the first one. In fact, he loves this number and she repeats it uh, over and over again. In fact, the video you saw is the last of three different shows. What does she want to express through this number? Well, uh, in this number she uses the kind of bipolar, multiple personality swings of Smeagol and Gollum in the movie adaptation of Peter Jackson. Uh, in order to talk to the audience about the nature itself of drag, the artist creates a fictional character out of the standards where to shelter and through which he can express his own art and even be evil, what they call in their professional language, be a shady bitch. You can imagine you are a person, there is a monster, you struggle normally with it. But there arrives a day when you cease to struggle and you embrace your monstrous identity and then uh, you can express freely again. So that's what she means about uh, this struggle and embracing the monster she has inside. In her own words, deep inside, I will always be a kind of golem. In my case, I am a skinny and bald monster who tries to be stunning and live his fantasy on stage long enough to make the audience appreciate the beauty also in ugliness. You can see a couple of uh, shoots more. Here we are. And then for the last, uh, for the last slide, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to make it really quick. Here we have the sexploitation movies I have found. I have found more, but these are the three, the three examples of three different worlds that I wanted to display in here. The first one is called Lord of the G-String, the female uh, ship of the ring. It's a soft porn movie, which normally is, may, is uh, also named a spoof, because it's like a um, ridiculization of, of, uh, of the text. And I will, I will uh, read this synopsis because it's really, really funny. A little thrubbit from Diddle Earth called Dildo Saggins accepts the mission of destroying the G-string of power, which makes his owner almighty by throwing it into the party pooper volcano. In order to accomplish this mission, she is accompanied by her friend Throbbit's Spam and Horny. On their way, they find Smirnoff the wizard, the exile queen Araporn from Mufonia, and the creature Bolum. Their enemies are the wizard Sauras and his dork army. The second example I have set over there is an independent underground gay porn movie called Lord of the Cock Ring, where Scroto Baggins is a geek who possesses a mighty penis ring. I'm making serious effort not to laugh. <laughs> and the third one is the most widely known, perhaps it's The Whore of the Rings, which also has a sequel, The Whore of the Rings. It was so successful that it needed a sequel. It's a hardcore porn movie uh, where a hobbit girl finds the one dildo that belongs to Sauron, which happens to be that lady in the chainmail bikini, who reclaims it and for it she uses her dildo wraiths. We have also stellar apparitions from characters similar in a way to Gollum and to an end. As I said at the beginning, it's a brief overview of very interesting fields of study that deserve a presentation on their own. 
I hope you enjoyed this presentation as much as I enjoyed researching for it because I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Let's see. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Monica. It's it's clear that uh, Tolkien has had an impact around so many different cultures around the world, um, as well. So, like you're saying, so many subcultures as well have used um, Tolkien in so many various ways, um, as well. So, uh, thank you for um, making us aware of how just how many uh, different ways that he's been used so okay we have uh, time for a few questions so again if you would like to raise your hand if you would like to ask Monica a verbal question and if not just pop your uh, question in the Q&A uh, rather than the chat please okay so we have a first question uh, by Rita who has asked um, how is it that the fascist, uh, the fascist ideology uh, that was against what Tolkien thought, took Tolkien's work as an inspiration for such a large festival. So I think that the, the novel itself is so applicable, this applicability of Tolkien, that everyone can see a different way of expressing through the words of talking so they can take ideas and they can also mold them to fit into the, their own ideologies so right now we know the opinion of talking about these themes but they did in 1977 okay thank you um and we have a question uh, posed by nick so nick i'm just going to allow you to talk so you just need to unmute yourself and off you go. Okay, uh, Monica, do you know of any Tolkien influences on the punk subculture? I have researched very deeply, but I found nothing. And I love the, pulks, the punk subculture, but I know nothing about any evidence of any influence in the punk subculture. I'm eager to find any and to include them in the presentation. Awesome, thank you. Okay. So, thank you, Nick. And we have a question here from Ashlyn um, as well, asking, um, is there any expression of Tolkien's work you would personally consider to be over-exploitation, that is to go beyond the boundaries in a bad way? Beyond the boundaries in a bad way? Um, I think the works of Tolkien are quite moderate. I think I cannot find any expression, any part of his works that belong to of exploitation. There are no black exploitation, there are no exploitation and drug use or anything. So no, I think he would be horrified to learn that uh, his works were interpreted in exploitation films. Okay, super, thank you very much. And I think... Yeah, okay. Okay, and then one final question, just quickly from Ava. So, um, hi Monica, have you any thoughts about the world of fan fiction? Oh, fan fiction! Wow, <laughs> that deserves a presentation on itself, and not a twenty-minute presentation. It deserves a an hour and a half presentation about fan fiction, not just about the fan fiction that had been written, but uh, the genres inside the fan fiction that fanfic writers have touched also. Uh, we had a presentation in the Talking Society of Spain, I think it was like five years ago, about the world of fan fiction, and we even had some writers over there writing for fan fiction about talking and also about lots and lots of topics inside Tolkien's works. So yeah, it deserves a presentation on its own. Mm 